medicals. Good day to all of you. This is Dr. BK for you, and today I am here to discuss about the extra hepatic biliary apparatus. Now, first, let us define what is actually extra hepatic biliary apparatus. So, it is actually the set of duct systems which actually helps to transmit bile to store it for future use and also to secrete into the small intestine whenever necessary. So, our objectives of today's session will be so a small introduction about this biliary apparatus or the duct system which conveys and stores the bile followed by that what are the components which are involved in the transport of bile so the hepatic ducts then you have the gallbladder and the common bile duct so we are going to see the anatomy of these structures their relations their internal futures and followed by that blood supply of these ducts and uh, finally we will actually close with our clinical anatomy or the clinical aspects of this extra hepatic biliary apparatus so first of all when we tell about the extra hepatic biliary apparatus it is quite natural that we should also have an intra hepatic biliary apparatus so here in this picture you are able to see an hepatic lobules which are hexagonal in shape so at the ends or the periphery you are able to see the portal triads so the portal triads mainly consist of a branch of hepatic artery bile duct and the port and a branch of the portal vein now they are actually how they are formed in between the cells these radiating cells you all see they are the hepatocytes they are present in a laminated packet the lamina of cells you are seeing here in between these what you see is the hepatic sinusoids so the sinusoids of the liver are present in the form of the hepatic sinusoids so the hepatic sinusoids convey the blood from the portal vein to the center of the hepatic lobule that is the central vein okay so from there what happens is then the blood from there starts via the hepatic veins and drains into the inferior vena cava so the blood in the hepatic sinusoids actually they are in the form of centripetal in direction that means they travel from the periphery to the center now in the same way if you are able to see almost it is hexagonal so that means it should have almost six ends other than the surfaces which are not occupied by the hepatic sinusoids you have the bile canaliculi running in between the hepatocytes the bile canaliculi what happens is once they reach the periphery they form the herring canals or ducts and from there they give rise to the biliary ductules so the biliary ductules what happens is interlobar ductules they form from there what happens they form from intralobar they form interlobar ductules and from the interlobar ductules what happens is they give rise to the hepatic ducts or the bile ducts they give rise to hepatic ducts or the bile ducts so biliary apparatus consists of those structures which collect bile from the liver so the small small ductules they form interlobular intralobular interlobular and from there 
finally they come out of the liver as the right and left hepatic duct which unites to form the common hepatic duct okay which unites to form the common hepatic duct up to this it is actually the intrahepatic biliary system consist of as i told you by canaliculi which is running in between the hepatocytes by ductules and finally the right and left hepatic duct now from outside the liver starting from the porta hepatis the components are the common hepatic duct of the union of right and left hepatic duct which is joined by the cystic duct the duct of the gall bladder at an acute angle it joins the common hepatic duct after the joining of the common hepatic duct what happens is it is called as the common bile duct so that is the extra hepatic biliary apparatus or the biliary duct system mainly your common hepatic duct gall bladder with the cystic duct after the urine of cystic duct it is actually called as the common bile duct this is the extra hepatic biliary system so here you are able to see how from the bile canaliculi so between the hepatocytes they form ductules to the periphery they come so their direction is actually centrifugal in nature opposite to the direction of the hepatic sinusoid so numerous ductules unite to form a bile duct and then finally they come out as right and left hepatic duct so the main function of this extra hepatic biliary system is concentrates the bile which is in the gall bladder and stores them okay in the gall bladder again it stores the bile and releases them when required okay releases them when required now apart from that the secretion of the bile is actually constant and it is present throughout the bile duct it is not that it is completely empty it is actually also present in the common bile duct also you have the bile which is present there and gall bladder contracts when more amount of bile is required when the more amount of bile is required in between meals when we receive or when we eat a fatty meal which comes to the duodenum then what happens the gall bladder starts contraction to release the bile in squids so what i need to tell is the cystic duct bile moves in and out of the cystic duct so whenever when a fatty meal appears through the cystic duct it comes out otherwise in a normal it gets also filled the gall bladder also gets filled via this cystic duct only so here you are able to see a closer view of the porta hepatis so this is actually the porta hepatis where the structures enter and leave the liver but this is not the true gateway or hilum of the liver the true hilum of the liver is where the hepatic veins pierce and open into the ibc which is seen on the posterior surface of the liver the unit of right and left hepatic ducts from the right and left physiological lobes of the liver anatomical classification of the liver into right and left lobe is different from the physiological classification of the right and left lobes of the liver anatomic classification is simply the the falciform ligament so the right of the falciform ligament and left of the falciform ligament with respect to right and left lobes of the liver but here physiologically it is the those lobes right lobe and left lobe are supplied by corresponding branches of right and left hepatic artery right and left branch of portal vein and actually the right and left hepatic ducts the union of these two ducts takes place at the right end of the porta hepatis right end of the porta hepatis 
it is 3 centimeters long, a short duct 3 centimeters in long and uh, the internal diameter might be around 4 millimeter. To the left of it, you see the proper hepatic artery. To the left of it, what you see is the proper hepatic artery and behind these two and between them is the portal vein. This is the arrangement of structures. Okay. Then, to the right of it and below, you see the cystic duct. To the right of it and below, what you see is the cystic duct. So about 2.5 centimeters or 3 centimeters, that is what I told you, that will be the total length of the common hepatic duct. That will be joined by the cystic duct at an acute angle and after the point of joining of the cystic duct, then you call this as the common bile duct. This is actually seen on the common bile duct. So, this common bile duct is again seen on the right free margin of the lesser common tub. The common bile duct unites with the main pancreatic duct and then opens into the second part of the duodenum. So, we have seen the first component that is the union of the right and left hepatic ducts form the common hepatic duct. Now, we will come to gallbladder. So, anything we call it as gallbladder or urinary bladder is a sac or a pouch. Any sac or pouch you call it as a bladder. It is pure shaped and you call it a slate blue in color. Pure shaped organ, you are able to see the fruit pure, slate blue in color. Its capacity is around 30 to 50 ml and 7 to 10 centimeters in length. 7 to 10 centimeters in length, that is the total length of the gallbladder. Pear shaped organ, 7 to 10 centimeters in length. Mainly it stores the bile and concentrates the bile and also makes the bile alkaline stores, concentrates and also makes the bile alkaline. The extension of the gallbladder is from near the porta hepatis cystic duct to the inferior border of the liver. So, it secretes bile by scripts means by contraction. So, when does it contracts? When a fatty meal enters the duodenum, then naturally what happens? The duodenum secretes cholecystokinin. This enzyme cholecystokinin, what happens is stimulates this gallbladder to release the bile stored from it. And naturally what happens is it releases the bile in the form of rhythmic contractions. So, cholecystokinin secreted by the duodenum when the fatty food enters it. If you look at the structure or parts of the gallbladder, the most expanded or distended part is actually called as the fundus. Then you have a body and finally you have a neck. Fundus, body and neck are actually parts of the gallbladder. Where actually it is situated? It is situated on the under surface or it is also called as the inferior or visceral surface of the liver. We have a depression for the gallbladder which is called as the fossa for gallbladder. Okay. The fossa for gallbladder. The gallbladder is situated in the fossa for gallbladder and the fundus projects beyond the inferior border of the liver. It is intimately related to the fossa for gallbladder with some connective tissue present between them separating it. But sometimes it might be loosely hanging from the inferior surface by a mesentery. Occasional, not always. It may be free mobile instead of being a fixed organ. Okay. So, by the connective tissue it is attached and that area of the liver is not covered by the peritoneum. The peritoneum after covering the under surface of the liver, 
then it comes to cover the under surface of the gallbladder it does not go beyond sorry between the gallbladder and the fossa for gallbladder so fossa for gallbladder is actually a non peritoneal area of the liver so from the right end of porta hepatis to the inferior border of the liver is the extension of the gallbladder as it will be 7 to 10 cm in length and 30 to 50 ml is its total capacity so pus as i mentioned earlier it is fundus body neck and the duct is this cystic duct so here you are able to see the fundus fundus is that part of the gallbladder or the organ that projects beyond the inferior margin of the liver beyond the inferior margin you can see this area the most dilated part is actually called as the fundus of the gallbladder it is covered by peritoneum above and below so that part of the gallbladder is actually covered by peritoneum on both the surfaces on both the surfaces covered by peritoneum on all the sides this fundus is fundus of gallbladder is related to transpyloric plane transpyloric plane which cuts through the tip of ninth costal cartilage tip of ninth costal cartilage you are able to understand so that is the fundus of the gallbladder where your right lateral plane right lateral plane and the transpyloric plane they meet is where the fundus of gallbladder actually lies and it is in direct contact with the anterior abdominal wall it is in direct contact with the anterior abdominal wall just below the tip of the ninth costal cartilage so it is related to the transverse colon behind it is related to the transverse colon in front anterior abdominal wall that is about the fundus of gallbladder the body of the gallbladder is related to the upper surface of the liver and some connective tissue is present so between the upper surface of the body and the under surface of the liver you see some deep branches of cystic artery ramifying over it and sometimes cystic veins also you can see between the upper surface of the gallbladder and under surface of the liver that is the fossa for gallbladder fossa for gallbladder and that surface is not covered by the peritone Whereas the inferior surface of the body is related to second part of duodenum. It is related to the second part of duodenum and also your transverse colon. Second part of duodenum and transverse colon. Now from here the body is directed backwards and left to join the neck. You have the fundus, then you have the body of the gallbladder. Next, we will look about the neck of the gallbladder. So, here you see a short neck, narrow, present here to the right end of the porta hepatis. This is the left end, and that is the right end of the porta hepatis. The neck sharply turns downwards to become continuous with the cystic duct. Becomes to become continuous with the cystic duct it is related to the first part of the duodenum it is related to the first part of the duodenum and the neck sometimes shows a dilatation which is actually called as the hartman's pouch so a dilatation on the posterior medial wall of the neck is actually called as the hartman's pouch and that part of the gallbladder which connects the hartman's pouch with the main gallbladder is sometimes considered as the isthmus of gallbladder. It is actually sometimes considered as the isthmus of gallbladder. So, in a dilatation, 
the posterior medial wall of the neck is actually called as the Hartmann's pouch. Now, this surface, neck of the gallbladder, is intimately related to the first part of the duodenum. It is intimately related to the first part of the duodenum. So, in cholecystitis, inflammation of the gallbladder, what happens is it might lead to perforation of the first part of duodenum. So, perforation of first part of duodenum might take place and gallstones sometimes might get lodged or trapped in this Hartmann's pouch. So, neck is intimately related to the first part of duodenum. So, that is why inflammation can lead to perforation of the first part of the duodenum. So, here you are able to see the neck of the gallbladder turning suddenly downwards like this to join with the cystic duct. Fundus projecting beyond the inferior border, then you have the body related to the fossa for the gallbladder, then you have the neck, neck sometimes shows a out pocketing or dilatation which is called as the Hartmann's pouch. To look at the structure of gallbladder, the mucosa is thrown into numerous holes. The mucosa is actually thrown into numerous holes, like a honeycomb appearance. Okay? It is thrown into a number of holes, which is honeycomb in appearance. The mucosa is actually lined by columnar epithelium. It is lined by the columnar epithelium, simple columnar epithelium. But sometimes you can also come across ciliated columnar epithelium. Deep to the mucosa, you have the fibromuscular coat and then the serous layer, which is the peritoneum. There is no submucosa in the gallbladder. So, you see the mucous layer, the lamina propria resting on it, and this is your fibromuscular coat. There is no submucosa. So, that means there is no glands in the gallbladder. So, gallbladder does not by itself secrete anything. But remember the ducts, the common bile duct, they are provided with the tubuloalveolar glands. The bile duct have some tubuloalveolar glands, so they might secrete mucus. But gallbladder, the only function is to store and concentrate the bile. So, mucosa, no submucosa, fibroelastic coat, and finally, you have the serosa of the peritoneum, which is covering the undersurface of the gallbladder. So, the blood supply to the gallbladder is by the cystic artery, which is a branch of the Right hepatic artery, common hepatic artery dividing proper, proper hepatic artery is to right and left the branch of the proper hepatic artery. From the right branch, what you have is the cystic artery. The cystic artery might divide into superficial branch which supplies the peritoneal surface of the gallbladder. Deep branch will supply the upper surface of the gallbladder. So, they will be present between the Force of our gallbladder for the liver and the upper surface. Weight is actually cystic weight which does not follow the course of the cystic artery. It will drain into right branch of portal vein or sometimes what happens is numerous small veins from the upper surface. Force of our gallbladder near there. It might actually from the upper surface, it may directly go to liver and from there to the hepatic veins. That is about the venous drainage. Lymphatics of the gallbladder, cystic nodes. You are able to see here, they are actually called as the cystic nodes. These cystic nodes ultimately will drain into hepatic nodes. They are called as cystic nodes of lung and from there they may ultimately go to the celiac nodes. You are able to see these. Around the celiac axis or celiac trunk is actually called as the celiac nodes. So, that is about the blood supply, venous drainage, and the lymphatic drainage of the gallbladder. Now, the duct of the gallbladder is actually called as the cystic duct. It joins with the common hepatic duct at an acute angle. 
Again, it is 3 to 5 centimeters in length and the internal diameter is just around 2 mm. Okay. So, it is again mainly seen in the lesser momentum. If you look at the interior of the cystic duct, if you look at the interior of the cystic duct, it is actually thrown into numerous folds. The mucosa is thrown into numerous folds, which is actually called as the valves of Easter, H E I S T E R. They help to keep the cystic duct patent always open so that the walls do not get approximated. And this is also responsible for delivering the bile in squids, okay, like uh, ink, like ink which is actually projecting from the ink tube or something like that. So, valves of Easter which keeps the duct patent or open. So, bile flows in and out of the cystic duct, that is what I already told you. So, bile flows in when the sphincter ear is closed. When the sphincter is open, then bile flows out from the gallbladder. Otherwise, from the hepatic duct, bile flows into the cystic duct and into the gallbladder. It is mainly if the common bile duct is closed. So, more common for variations, hypoplasia, reduced gallbladder, agenesis, complete absence of gallbladder. Gallbladder is not an indispensable for life. Without gallbladder, naturally a person can lead a healthy life because bile ducts are there to convey the bile. Even though gallbladder concentrates the bile, the bile duct again dilutes it through its secretions. Phrygian cap is again, body of the gallbladder shows a diverticulum like this, it is not a pathological condition. Some outpocketing or diverticulum, hourglass constriction, bilobed gallbladder, septate gallbladder, inside the body of the fundus is divided by a septum and duplication of the gallbladder, double gallbladder with a double cystic duct or common cystic duct, then numerical gallbladder. All are common in case of the adenoids. So, septate mobile, highly mobile that I told you, sometimes it is suspended from the force of our gallbladder by a decent tree. Phrygian cap, this is what infolding of the wall of the gallbladder. Then intrahepatic, it is very much adhered to the under surface of the liver, absence of gallbladder. Coming to the anomalies of accessory hepatic ducts. So, right or left hepatic duct, sometimes you have an accessory hepatic duct which might open into the common hepatic duct or it might open into the cystic duct or it might open into the bile duct or sometimes it might open directly into the gallbladder through the force of our gallbladder. Okay? And sometimes two accessory hepatic ducts, one on the right side and one on the left side. All these are developmental anomalies. Okay? During the process of development, these anomalies might take place. These are accessory hepatic ducts, might open anywhere into the cystic duct or bile duct or common hepatic duct. <coughs> cystic duct variations, that is accessory hepatic duct. Now, cystic duct, you are able to see a very long cystic duct where it unites at a very lower level. Here, cystic duct and the common hepatic duct are adhered together. Some additions are there. Connective tissue might actually bind them together. Very high union at a very higher level. Just after the emergence of the right and left hepatic duct and union it takes place. Here, totally the cystic duct is absent or very short. Here it takes a spiral course and opens into the left side of the common hepatic duct. Here in front of the common hepatic duct, here it goes behind the common hepatic duct, that is the difference. So the gallbladder, cystic duct are all most prone for these variations or congenital anomalies. So a knowledge of these is definitely necessary mainly for the surgeon who is going to perform any procedures on the gallbladder, mostly with the Removal of gallbladder, which is called as the polycystectomy. So, 
a knowledge of these various types of anomalies is absolutely necessary to successfully perform the Cooley cystic test. So, now the cystic gut here you are able to see internally these mucous folds are actually called as the spiral valves of yeast. So, after joining with the common hepatic duct, now it is actually called as the bile duct. So, almost 7.5 centimeters long and it can be studied at three parts. Above the first part of the urinum, it is called as supraduodenal part. Behind the first part of the urinum, it is called as the retroduodenal part. And below the first part of the urinum, it is actually called as the infraduodenal part. Supraduodenal retroduodenal and infraduodenal and finally a short course into the wall of the duodenum called as intraduodenal okay infraduodenal and then intraduodenal part now first looking at the supraduodenal part of the common bile tract so the relations are very easy we have seen this so many times with respect to the celiac trunk branches hepatic artery peritoneum lesser omentum lesser sac all these things we have discussed about this see in the right free margin of the lesser momentum to the left what you see is the hepatic artery behind what you see is the portal vein and more behind more posterior plate what you see is the inferior vena cava so that is the supraduodenal part right side left side what you have the hepatic artery behind and in between what you see is the portal vein and more posterior vein what you see is the inferior vena cava. That is the supraduodenal part of the bile duct, common bile duct, CBD. Most accessible part for the surgery, for a surgeon to access it is most accessible because it is not actually behind or covered by any other organ or viscera. The next part is the next to supraduodenal part, you see the retroduodenal part behind the duodenum. <coughs> Only thing you have to change is the relations are the same. Anteriorly, you have the first part of duodenum. To the left, instead of hepatic artery, we have to substitute it with a gastroduodenal artery. Gastroduodenal artery, and behind you have the IVs. Same IVC behind to the left instead of hepatic artery, you make it gastroduodenal artery. You can see the gastroduodenal artery to the left of it and anteriorly the first part of the duodenum. Next, what you see is the infraduodenal part. This part is actually the infraduodenal part. It is largely grooved in the head of the pancreas, posterior surface of the pancreas. Closely related to the gastroduodenal artery, and from the gastroduodenal artery, we we'll give superior pancreatico duodenal artery. The superior pancreatico duodenal artery will give rise to anterior branch and posterior branch. So, we call anterior superior pancreatico duodenal, posterior superior pancreatico duodenal arteries. These superior pancreatico duodenal arteries. The anterior and posterior branch will anastomose with inferior pancreatico duodenal arteries. The inferior pancreatico duodenal artery is a branch of the superior mesenteric artery. So, you are able to see here the superior mesentery. So, infraduodenal part lodged in a group, the pancreas. So, in front it is related to the pancreas. The intraduodenal part pierces the wall of the second part of duodenum. So it pierces the wall of second part of duodenum, joins the main pancreatic duct, and then forms a dilatation which is called as hepatopancreatic ampulla or ampulla of water. So that bunches into the mucosa, forming the papillae or raised margin in the mucosa, which is called as the major duodenal papillae. So, the major duodenal papillae receives the opening of the hepatopancreatic ampulla. What is that hepatopancreatic ampulla? It is actually a mild dilatation which is formed by the union of the common bile duct and the main pancreatic duct. 
So you are able to see that this is actually the common bile duct, this is the pancreatic duct, both are united to form a dilatation which is called as the hepatopancreatic ampullae that pierces the wall of the duodenum, intraduodenal part and opens into the major duodenal papilla. Now, this part that is the distal or the end part of the bile duct is surrounded by a sphincter which is actually called as the sphincter collidocus or sphincter of Boyden. Then you have a sphincter around the main pancreatic duct which is actually called as the sphincter pancreaticus. Then after the union, the ampulla is actually guarded by a sphincter which is actually called as the sphincter of body. Now of these three, the most strongest sphincter is the sphincter collidocus or sphincter of Boyden. Whereas the sphincter pancreaticus and the sphincter of Audi might be even be absent in one sixth of the human subjects. The sphincter of Boyden offers resistance to the bile duct. So the resistance is around uh, 20 centimeters mm, 20 mm of not Hg water, 20 mm of water. Whereas bile ductal pressure normally will be around 15, around 15. The bile ductal pressure should be below the pressure of the, should be not, which is below the pressure of the sphincter of void. Now when a fatty meal arrives, the cholecystokinin which is secreted by the duodenum reaches the gallbladder and stimulates the gallbladder to secrete the bile. So, when the bile is secreted, more and more amount of bile is secreted from the gallbladder by the contraction of the gallbladder. So, the bile ductal pressure increases. So, it might increase from 25, from 20 to, it might increase to 25 mm to 30 mm of water. So, then if this pressure increases naturally, the sphincter voidance pressure falls and thereby releases the bile. So that is how the bile is actually secreted. So bile is mainly responsible for emulsification of the fatty meal. Okay. Whereas pancreatic juice is also mainly for proteins, digestion of proteins. Pancreozymic, trypsin, all those things are actually present in the pancreatic juice. Okay. So cholecystokinin relaxes the sphincter, the bile ductal pressure falls and then bile enters into the second part of the duodenum. You also have the variations of the common bile duct. So this is the common bile duct, this is actually the pancreatic duct, very short communication, common part, union. Here they are not at all uniting, both are separate and might open separately. Here very high union, so you have a very long hepatopancreatic part or hepatopancreatic ampullae variations in the bile. So the throughout the extra hepatic biliary apparatus, it is more prone for the variations. So the blood supply of this bile duct, mostly the common bile duct, upper part will be supplied by the cystic artery. Then the lower part is mainly by the pancreatico, superior pancreatico duodenal artery and the middle part is by the right hepatic artery. Okay. So, cystic artery, hepatic artery, then gastro duodenal and superior pancreatico duodenal artery, mainly the branches, anterior and posterior branches of the superior pancreatico duodenal arteries. Now, if any ligation of the bile duct okay, or ligation of the superior pancreatic duodenal artery, if the anastomosis between the superior and inferior pancreatic duodenal artery is poor, the vascular anastomosis is poor and if you ligate the superior pancreatic duodenal artery, then the lower part of bile duct does not receive 
adequate blood supply and it might lead to gangre or it might get fibrosed forming a stricture stricture and thereby what happens is bile will not be able to you know the bile duct will not be able to secrete the bile into the second part of the duodenum so this vascular anastomosis if it is poor it may lead to gangrene of the bile duct with the superior pancreatic duodenal artery is ligated so other clinical aspects with respect to the extra hepatic biliary apparatus the most cholecystectomy during cholecystectomy removal of the gall bladder if it is inflamed too much or gall stones are present then what happens is the pedicle of the gall bladder has to be ligated so mainly you have to ligate the blood vessel which is identified in this callous triangle the boundaries of callous triangle are it is mainly above and lateral form of the inferior surface of the liver below and lateral by the cystic duct and medially by the common hepatic duct inferior surface of liver cystic duct and common hepatic duct so in this triangular callous triangle mainly you come across the cystic artery main content then apart from that you also come across lymph nodes cystic lymph nodes and <coughs> cystic vein so usually how it is arranged in front the duct then you have the artery then behind you have the vein that is how the structures are arranged so callous triangle you have to it's mainly useful in identification of the cystic artery and ligating it during cholecystectomy and right hepatic artery also sometimes comes into this content because the cystic artery comes from the right hepatic artery so you should be careful enough not to ligate the right hepatic artery then the blood supply to the liver actually will be interrupted so mainly this triangle is useful in ligating the cystic artery identifying the cystic artery in the triangle and ligating during cholecystectomy so inflammation of the gall bladder is actually called as cholecystitis pain when the gall bladder is distended you feel tenderness over the tip of ninth costal cartilage so when you touch the tip of the ninth costal cartilage and then when you ask the patient to inhale and he will feel pain and tenderness over the tip of ninth costal cartilage which is actually called as the murphy's sign so formation of gall stones is actually called as cholelithiasis and it is believed that more common in fat fertile fatty females females who are above 40 who are fat who are fertile four fs 40 fatty fertile females are more prone for this so gall stones are also formed mainly due to other factors like certain contraceptives estrogen hormones are also play a fact influence the formation of uh, gall stones so when the gall stones are formed it might obstruct the flow of bile based on the size of the stones sometimes it may pass through the gall bladder and obstruct the bile duct <coughs> so to identify whether there is any obstruction cooley cystograph you inject orally a radio opaque dye and then what happens after taking x ray you see whether there is any filling defect in the gall bladder or the cystic duct so if the gall bladder is not filled then there it is not functional the gall bladder is not functioning so mainly to test the patency of the gall bladder and the bile duct which is called as cooley cystograph sometimes acute cooley cystitis referred pain is felt over the tip of the right shoulder because post ganglionic sympathetic fibers is conveyed 
to the gall bladder via the phrenic nerve so naturally what happens is inflammation of the gall bladder by sometimes irritate the phrenic nerve and you feel pain over the tip of the right shoulder which is called as the referred pain in case of cholecystitis so biliary colic spasm of smooth muscle gall bladder because if there is stones in the gall bladder but it wants to expel the bile so contractions as the stone passes through the duct you feel extreme pain which is actually called as the biliary colic sometimes the sympathetic fibers to the gall bladder is from the t7 and t9 the sympathetic supply is from t7 t9 segments which also is responsible for the innervation of the epigastric region so you also feel epigastric pain in case of the cholecystitis so epigastric pain may be usually suspect mainly for any stomach ulcers carcinoma of the stomach all those things are liver sometimes <coughs> sometimes very rarely even the pancreatic pain might uh, actually be felt in the epigastric even though it is more posterior and felt at the back sometimes and at the same time epigastric pain you should also suspect for inflammation of the gall bladder so obstruction of gall bladder is common bile duct so any stone may get impacted here and obstruct the flow of bile so you get obstructive jaundice okay so obstructive jaundice what reason the bile duct is obstructed due to the gall stones internally the lumen is obstructed or compression from outside mainly due to any neoplasm or growth of the pancreas head of the pancreas so that also might obstruct and sometimes developmental anomalies of the pancreas which is called as annular pancreas it will surround the duodenum and thereby that also might obstruct the bile so then what happens is most common condition what you see is jaundice yellow discoloration of the skin sclera and mucus membrane now corvoises law helps to differentiate between intrinsic or extrinsic obstruction of bile extrinsic obstruction of bile is mainly due to compression of the bile duct due to the carcinoma of the pancreas or annular pancreas in that case what happens is the bile there will be tenderness over the gall bladder the gall bladder will be distended the gall bladder will actually be distended whereas if it is an intrinsic factor the lumen is obstructed because of the gall stones then gall bladder will not be distended it may be shrunken it may be fibrosed okay and that does not occur acutely it usually chronically it takes place for the gall bladder to make uh, or obstruct the bile duct so always small helps us to differentiate between the extrinsic and intrinsic obstruction of the bile duct endoscopic retrograde cholangio pancreatography which is called as ERCP so endoscope is introduced orally through the stomach to the second part of the duodenum then you introduce a catheter and then you inject a radio opaque substance that is actually called as ERCP to again check the patency of the biliary system extra hepatic apparatus percutaneous is again transhepatic cholangiography is another method but uh, usually not practiced nowadays after the endoscopic procedures have taken the uh, mainly dominance because this is not invasive whereas percutaneous transhepatic cholangiography most used as a therapeutic purpose <coughs> again to see the biliary tree so that is all about the extra hepatic biliary apparatus and thank you very much for your patient listening